hopefully this will be working better today. Still not entirely sure. Um, okay, quick announcement. Uh, come on in. Uh, we've started pushing people uh, off the, the wait list and into the regular course. If you got an email from me about that this afternoon, then uh, I expect you'll see yourself on SSOL uh, in the course tomorrow. Uh, for those of you who didn't get an email from me, there's still a pretty good chance that you'll be allowed to enroll in the course, but that depends on uh, one or more people dropping out uh, before Friday. Um, so we'll have to see about that. But certainly if you haven't gotten an email from me saying that you're in uh, yet, make at least tentative plans for, for seeing about another course because uh, with the wave of, of people we moved off, we're at uh, the maximum. So have other plans in mind, uh, but it is still a pretty good chance uh, that you'll be able to get in. Come on, everybody. Uh, yes? So if you've been a student this last year in the uh, is it guaranteed that you can take the classes uh, and sign up in school? Uh, not anymore. Okay. So the, the QMS as immunity has expired. Uh, but if you are already in, then you're in. Uh, yes? What is the rule for preliminary rules? Uh, subject to approval, but I think that will happen today. As you can see, we're kind of violating the fire code. Um, anyway, other questions about that? Uh, yes? I've already seen myself enrolled in December. Uh -huh. I'm a non-CRMSS student, uh -huh. uh, but I didn't get any email. Uh, yeah, so you, yeah, you're in. Uh, if you can see, uh, if you can see your name on Canvas, you're definitely in. Yeah, with Teachers College, it's different because they're on a not the SSOL system, so I forgot to send you an email, but anyway. Come on in. Uh, yeah. So again, for those of you who have laptops, you go ahead and take a desk. If you didn't bring your laptop, give your desk to somebody who uh, has one. Okay. So uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, more about probability theory for discrete uh, random variables after we talk about the fact that this being Columbia, uh, this being a Columbia that is very concerned about it, uh, appearances of conflict of interest, I have to disclose to you uh, and the entire YouTube world uh, that you should be aware of uh, the policy that uh, I am subject to. And you should also be aware that we were featured on Billions, which I'm pretty sure is the only Columbia Research Project to ever figure in the plot of a like Emmy-winning um, cable show, but such is life. Okay, so if for those of you who have uh, your laptop in R, if you source in uh, this URL, tinyurl.com 2020bowling2, that will bring in the code uh, that we were talking about last Thursday uh, with the probability function we were using for bowling, and again, just to review what we have going on in this uh, square here, that the row index uh, pertains to the number of pins knocked down on the first roll of a frame of bowling, the column index pertains to the number of pins knocked down in the second roll of the same frame of bowling, and then the numbers in the middle are the probability of both of those things happening. So in this case here, uh, this represents the probability of knocking down seven pins on the first roll of a frame of bowling and three pins on the second roll of a frame of bowling, and that probability comes out to 0.38793. How did I arrive at that number, 0.038793? or like any of these numbers here? Yeah. Oh. Well, it's just a probability of one of those events given the other. And like, you know, so if you have uh, an X of X and uh, Y, like you look at uh, event number one, like and then you can determine the probability of event number two. Right, and then what do I do with those two probabilities? 
to get one probability. Multiply. multiply, right. So using the general multiplication rule, multiplying a marginal probability of uh, the number of pins knocked down in the first roll of a frame of bowling times the conditional probability of knocking down, in this case, three pins on the second roll of the same frame of bowling, given that there are 10 minus 7 or three pins still standing up available to be knocked down. And the same for any other, you know, cell. So, you know, eight pins on the first roll and one pin on the second roll would be this square here, 0.036638, etc. All the ones in red are for things that have probability zero because they entail knocking down more than 10 pins on the same frame of bowling. And so those can't happen. Only the things in the top triangle uh, are allowed to happen. And then what is the sum of all the numbers in black? One, correct. This is a valid bivariate uh, probability function. So something has to happen over these two rolls of the same frame of bowling. And that is uh, represented by one of the 66 numbers in black here, corresponding to every combination of, of two things that can happen on a frame of bowling. All right. And this is kind of the basic uh, building block of what we need to work with. Uh, yeah. So transition matrices that we do with uh, Markov processes, those are going to have rows that sum to 1. Now, this is a square matrix, and transition matrices are also square matrices. And transition matrices also have uh, probabilities in them. But either the rows or the columns of a transition matrix are going to sum to 1. In this case, none of the rows sum to 1, but all of the rows sum to 1 together. So this is really just an uh, organizer for our 66 probabilities rather than a special entity that uh, reflects the, the transition. And bowling isn't, well, I suppose you could represent it as a Markov process, but it's not a very complicated one because you're always going back to the state where 10 pins are up um, as each frame goes by. So yeah, I guess I could write down a Markov uh, thing for that, but this is not that. This is merely the bivariate probability of what happens on roll one, what happens on roll two of the same frame. Got it? OK, how did we obtain the marginal probability for the probability of knocking down some number of pins on the second roll of a frame of bowling without specifying what happens on the first roll of the frame of bowling. Sum down the columns. All right. So we can go from a bivariate probability to a marginal probability by summation either down the columns or across the rows to get back either set of marginal probabilities and if we uh, are looking for a conditional probability and all we have is this information here, how do we get the conditional probability of saying, you know, what happens on roll one given that something happened on roll two? Conditioning on what happens on the second roll, we want to divide by the marginal probability of the second roll, which we just said was a column sum. If we wanted the conditional probability for what happens on roll two given roll one, then we would take one of these cells and divide by the sum of its row to condition on what happened in uh, roll one. But that's kind of a complicated procedure for doing something that we already know because the probability function we were using with the ratio of Fibonacci's can easily tell us 
the probability of what happens on roll two given what happens on roll one. It's just n is equal to 10 minus x1, and you go from there. The more complicated one where we need to use Bayes' rule is, you know, let's say the data on roll one was missing, but we have data on what happened on the second roll, and we're trying to get the probabilities for what happened on the first roll. We do that by taking any of these cells, dividing by the marginal probability given by its column sum, and that is going to be a valid conditional probability. Another way of looking at it, uh, I think last time we talked about the event conditioning on four pins being knocked down on the second roll of a frame of bowling. So if I say, okay, I knocked down four pins on my second roll, I know that something in this column uh, is going to pertain rather than all this thing 0, 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, which I know didn't happen on the second roll. But merely saying, okay, four pins got knocked down on the second roll doesn't tell me anything specifically about whether it was zero, one, two, three, four, five, or six on the first roll relative to what I already thought would be sort of what's more or less likely on the first roll given my probability function. So I know that it's uh, somewhere in column four because I have data four pins got knocked down on the second roll. That in itself doesn't tell me in relative terms which of these are any more likely beyond what was already implied by my function. And so in order to get the conditional probability of what happens on the first roll, given that four pins were knocked down on the second, we take any of these numbers, divide by the column sum, that keeps them in the same proportion but now the conditional probabilities, once you divide by their sum, once you divide the joint probabilities by their sum, are now going to add up to one and again are restored to being a valid uh, probability function over the possibilities that x1 could be, which in this case is just zero through six because the other ones can't happen if four pins got knocked down on the second roll. Questions about that? All right, so uh, PR is this function that uh, returns the probabilities for what happens on the first roll. Omega is our sample space. The integers between 0 and 10. Question for you is, what is the mode? What is the median? What is the expectation? Those are three different things. Uh, for what happens on the first roll of a frame of bowling. So what is the mode in this case? Let everybody think about that for a second. Hmm? Ten. Ten. Right. <clears throat> so the mode is the element of the sample space omega that has the highest probability, which in this case is ten. Uh, 0.38 is larger than any of the other numbers for the probability in that uh, sample space. OK, oops, damn. <laughs> what is the median uh, for what happens on the first roll of a frame of bowling? Oh, I, uh, two minus something, it's literally on the screen. Nine. <laughs> Nine. The median can actually be defined in uh, slightly different ways. The, the correct definition, the one we're going to use in this class, the smallest element of the sample space such that at least half of the cumulative probability is less than or equal to that element, and consequently at most half is greater than that. In this case, we see the only element greater than 9 is 10, and that has probability 0.38 which is less than uh, 0.5, and then this is 0.237. So the probability of 9 or 10 is greater than 0.5. That means the smallest element of the sample space, such that at least half of the probability is less than or equal to something, is 9. And so the median for the number of pins knocked down in the first roll of a frame of bowling under our model is 9 which is not 10. So in general, the mode and the median can be 
different numbers, but there are always different concepts. Questions about that? Okay. What is the expectation for the number of pins knocked down on the first roll of a frame of bowling under our simple model? Uh, add them together? Yes. <clears throat> right. So the expectation of a discrete random variable x, in this case number of pins knocked down, first roll of a frame of bowling, is defined as the sum over the entire sample space of uh, the corresponding element of the sample space with its probability. Add up all those, in this case, 11 uh, products together. That is the uh, value, which is the expectation of this random variable. And the expectation is so important in probability that it has its own symbol, mu. So if you see mu used, that is almost always going to be referring to the expectation of some uh, random variable. So a few things uh, to bear in mind. The word expectation in English uh, is sort of a strange uh, word. It, it tends to mean this is what should happen. Like the expectation is that you show up to work on time or you know something like that. Uh, expectation in this probability context means something very different. It's simply a probability weighted sum of the entire sample space. In this case, it's 8.431. If I take all those probabilities and multiply them by respective elements, add it all up, <clears throat> no one in the history of bowling has ever knocked down 8.431 pins. So there is no sense in which this is something that should happen. Indeed, this cannot happen. But uh, it's still the, the number that you get when you apply the definition of uh, expectation of a discrete random variable, and that makes sense, even in the case where omega uh, you know, is integers. <clears throat> We're multiplying integers by probabilities, which are real numbers, and we add it all up. So in general, we're going to get another real number, <clears throat> even though that falls outside of omega. So uh, don't get too caught up with what expectation tends to mean in a non-probability context, just basically memorize this definition um, uh, for a, uh, expectation because it's a very fundamental operation on uh, random variables and the probability functions that define them over the sample spaces, omegas. Questions about an expectation or how it differs from a mode or a median? Now, on Unfortunately, in a lot of introductory classes, there's a lot of focus on the normal distribution, which we won't get to next week. The normal distribution uh, for a continuous random variable is symmetric, and so the mode, the median, and the mean, or the expectation, all coincide. They happen to be the same number for symmetric distributions like the normal distribution, and that sort of encourages people who are learning these things and are not that comfortable with them to conflate them and saying, oh, they're all kind of the same thing. But in general, you can have asymmetric distributions, this case being one of them, in which the mode, the mean, and the median are not only different concepts, because they're always different concepts, but they're three different numbers in this case. So in general, the mode, the mean, and the median uh, do not need to coincide. They tell you different things. They're defined different ways. And it's only a coincidence that in some prominent cases, uh, they happen to yield the same number. Questions? Can we set out the expectation is like the more medium? Uh, it depends on which way it's skewed. It could be less than the mode or the median. It could be more. Uh, it does have a whole lot, uh, expectation is sort of influenced a lot by the extreme values of the sample space and whether you know, those have like high probability or low probability. So in general, 
um, uh, it's uh, hard to say, but in it, for any particular probability function, uh, we can figure out what the mode, the mean, and the median are and say which of the three is greater or less than or whatever. Other questions? All right. So a lot of people, uh, when they're referring to uh, expectation, they often use the word average or mean. Uh, we can be a little bit more precise here in that what you tend to think of uh, as the average or the mean is an estimator of an expectation. <clears throat> and uh, it's a particular estimator where we're estimating, let's say, the probability that y takes on some value as the proportion of times that we see in like n observations from data where that value is taken. Again, this i function is an indicator function. It equals 1 if the condition is true and equals 0 in the condition, if the condition is false. And so if we estimate the probability that y takes on you know, each of these values by the proportion of times that it happens in the data, we can come up with an estimator of expectation denoted mu hat also oftentimes denoted y bar um, <clears throat> by substituting uh, our definition or taking our definition for an expectation and replacing the true probability with our estimated probability, estimated probability being the proportion of times that we see this variable take on each value in the n observations of data that we have. So if we uh, take this here uh, as our estimate, <coughs> if we divide by n, but we can pull the 1 over n outside the summation, if we take this as our estimated probability of y, multiply it by the y values, sum up over the entire sample space, we can rewrite it uh, like this, <coughs> y times the indicator function wins that's true, and with a little bit of work, we can simplify to what you sort of usually see as the expression for an average or a mean, the sum of the values in your data <coughs> over the n observations that you have, divided by n. But that is a particular estimator of the expectation of this random variable with a plausible but nevertheless assumption as to how to estimate those probabilities with the proportions in which they occur in the sample. If you have a simple random sample, particularly if n is large, this is a quite reasonable estimator. But don't confuse an estimator of something with the thing that it's estimating. The expectation is what we're trying to estimate. It's a property of the function, the random variable we're talking about, pins knocked over in bowling, what have you. Our estimate of that uh, you know, is in general going to be different, but we're trying to get at the expectation by defining an estimator for that expectation. Also, it is true that uh, I usually use tildes over things to indicate a random draw from some distribution. Oh, did you have a question? Yeah, what did you say? Uh, OK, hold on to that. <clears throat> if I take uh, s random draws from a probability distribution and take their average, that is going to converge almost surely to the expectation I'm trying to estimate as S gets large. So in the case of a first roll of a frame of bowling, in the first line here, I have the exact calculation of the expectation by taking the sum of the entire sample space multiplied by the respective probabilities. That comes out to 8.431034 or something like that. <clears throat> and I could estimate that or approximate that number by taking a huge sample, in this case 10 million, uh, from omega with my probability sampling with replacement. Otherwise, I couldn't take a sample of uh, 10 billion from 11 numbers. Uh, and so that's going to make a huge random sample 
from omega with the corresponding probabilities. And if I average that, I get, why is my sister calling me? Uh, if I average that, I get 8.430, you know, seven, and something very close, correct to two, almost three decimal places. But it's still, you know, an estimator, an approximator. Only as s goes to infinity do these two things uh, converge, right? So is everybody clear on the difference between an expectation and the usual ways that we might go about estimating that expectation from data. Now you have a question. Yeah, so my question is, the, the expectation is exact value because it draws on the precise probability of the, the random variable. Yeah, it's a property of the function. Whereas the mean is an estimate of it because it draws from the sample that draws from right. the random variable. Right. So in frequentist terms, you can think of mu as a population parameter. And then we have, let's say, a simple random sample of size n or size s from that population with which we use to estimate uh, that expectation. <clears throat> but uh, from a Bayesian perspective, we might just say, OK, uh, you know, we're using these probability functions to describe our beliefs. <clears throat> and in order to estimate them, you know, we'll have to do something. But keep in mind, I would say the important principle here is that this definition of an expectation is purely a property of the random variable, whereas an estimator is a property of the data. But don't confuse what we're estimating with the way in which we're estimating it. So how would we calculate the expectation of what happens on the second roll of a frame of bowling, given that seven pins were knocked down on the first roll? How would we go about doing something like that to get a uh, conditional expectation using conditional probabilities? The, the base formula? Uh, this does not actually involve base formula. It's simpler than that. I mean, is it just the probability of x2 given that x1 was 7? Right. And then what's the sample space under consideration here? Zero to three, right. So those are the ones that have non-zero probability. And if we remember our ratio of Fibonacci uh, thing that gives us the probabilities, the first four Fibonacci numbers are one, one, uh, two, and three. And so the four probabilities, conditional probabilities, for what happens on the second roll, given that seven pins were knocked down on the first roll and three are still standing up on the second roll, uh, one seventh that we knock down zero, one seventh that we knock down one, two sevenths that we knock down uh, two, and three sevenths that we knock down three. If we take each of those, multiply them by the respective integers zero, one, two, three, add it all up, we get uh, two which is the conditional expectation for what happens on the second roll of a frame of bowling, given that seven pins were knocked down on the first roll. So that illustrates that if we use conditional probabilities in the definition of an expectation, we get a conditional expectation. If we use marginal probabilities in the definition of an expectation, we get a marginal expectation, etc. So we can do this with any valid probabilities that add up to one uh, over the sample space, perhaps after conditioning on something else, which may change what the sample space is. In this case, to exclude all of the things that entail more than 10 pins being knocked down. OK. So how would we calculate the expectation of the second roll in a frame of bowling without specifying what happens on the first roll? where would we get the probabilities that we need to calculate something like that? 
sum down the columns gives us the marginal probabilities. And then what do we do with those marginal probabilities? So the whole omega, and then after we've multiplied, what do we do? Sum. Right. So in our co or in math, it would look like this. <clears throat> so we need the marginal probabilities of knocking down x2 pins on the second. We can get that from the joint probabilities if we sum uh, down the columns. So joint probabilities here sum. And we can express those joint bivariate probabilities as marginal probability of knocking down xi pins on the first roll times the conditional probability of knocking down xj pins on the second roll, given that 10 minus xi pins are available to be knocked down, multiplying that by xj, and then summing it up over the integers between 0 and 10. So in our code, it would look like this. We take the column sums of our matrix that has the joint probabilities, to get the marginal probability of knocking down each number of pins on the second roll. <clears throat> then we sum the entire sample space omega multiplied by those marginal probabilities for the second roll. That's the definition of a marginal expectation. And we get the expectation of the second roll, which is 1.06. Very different from the expectation of the first roll, which was 8.432. Different probabilities different expectation, even though in this case, same sample space. Good. Questions? All right. So let's say C is some constant, which is to say not a random variable. Uh, what would be the expectation of C times X? Or what would be a notation, an expression for that? Not bowling in particular, just any discrete random variable. X? Right. So if C is a constant, then we can basically pull it out of the expectation uh, operation. Uh, and you can see it from this. The answer would be C times mu. So we have you know, C times X times the probability of x summed over uh, all the elements of the omega. But because it's a sum and c does not involve x, which is the index of the things we're summing over, we can pull it outside the sum. And then we just have the sum of x times the probability of x, which is mu, or the expectation of x. And consequently, the expectation of cx is just c times mu <laughs> for any constant c. So because the expectation is a linear operator, we can do things like that. So what would be a way that we could compute the expectation of the sum of two rolls in the same frame of bowling? So the fact that the expectation is a linear operator uh, means we can also kind of distribute the expectation operator over sums in addition to pulling out constants. And that is going to imply that the expectation of a sum is equal to the sum of the marginal expectations, even if those two are in general multiple events are not independent of each other. And we can show that uh, specifically by going through these steps. So the expectation of the sum of two discrete random variables, x and y, it's going to be the double summation over the whole sample space of x and the whole sample space of y of x plus y multiplied by the bivariate probability of little x occurring and little y occurring for summing over all possible values of little x and little y of their respective sample spaces. So that's uh, the first thing here. And how can we simplify that? Well, the first thing to notice is that this probability of x and y occurring, I can distribute it over the sum uh, x plus y. So I have x times the probability uh, uh, plus y times the probability. <clears throat> 
And then because the inner summation here is over y, <coughs> not involving x, uh, I can just pull the x out so it's in the middle of the two summations. So I have the summation over x of x times the summation uh, over the joint probability of x and y. Now if I sum over all possible values of y, my bivariate probability of x and y occurring, that's like summing down the columns or summing across the rows of my table. So this expression here is just equal to the marginal probability of x. <clears throat> Plus, and then by the same token, if I switch the order of the summations around, which is legal uh, with addition, and put the y in the middle, here I have <clears throat> the sum over the bivariate probability of x and y occurring over all values of x, which is just going to yield me the marginal probability of y. <clears throat> so that's going to leave me x, or the summation of x times the marginal probability of x, which is just the expectation of x, plus <clears throat> the summation y times the probability of y, which is just the expectation of y, leaving me with <clears throat> the sum of the two expectations, mu x and mu y. So indeed, it is the case that the expectation of the sum is equal to the sum of the expectations, even if x and y are not independent of each other. Now, you know, I wouldn't put like prove this or something like this on the final exam, but since this is only like two lines on a slide, it's good exercise to think through something like this to get your mind around the properties of expectations and when we can pull stuff out of them and when we can distribute over them and how we can simplify something involving some of this into a to expectation or something like that. So this is pretty easy. The only thing that's a little bit tricky is you know, pulling the x or the y in the middle of uh, two summations if the inner summation does not involve that. And then recognizing that the summation over one of the sample spaces of the bivariate probability is going to give you a marginal probability. And then you have you know, two marginal probabilities multiplied by their random variables and summed over their sample spaces give you two expectations that you sum together, which is equal to this. Right? So again, it's not something you necessarily need to have come up with on your own, but it's something that you need to be able to follow when somebody else points it out. And you know, remembering these sort of properties of expectations, they're linear. I can pull out constants. I can distribute over sums. The expectation of a sum is the sum of the expectations, et cetera. So questions how I did this? So uh, if we create this uh, matrix called total, which is already created if you summed in, uh, uh, sourced in that, which is just the row index minus 1, so it goes from 0 to 10, plus the column index minus 1, so it goes to 0 and 10. If I take the sum of my joint probability matrix and then multiply it element-wise by this matrix here, which... Uh, at the intersection of the row and column tells me the sum of the number of pins that were knocked down. So here, like index number four, that's like four on the first row, and let's say five on the second, nine total pins being knocked down. And the ones in red entail more than 10, and so those are going to have probability zero. But if I take my joint probability table, multiply it element-wise by this table here, and take the summation of that, I get my expectation for the sum of two pin, uh, two rolls of the same frame of bowling, 9.495, which we can see is the sum of 1.064 and uh, 8.431. So we can demonstrate what we, or substantiate what we showed algebraically with uh, R code here. We sort of calculate the expectation by multiplying the bivariate total by the bivariate probabilities and sum over everything. 
And then the other way to do it would be to just take the two marginal expectations and add them together. Same number. Yeah, that's not right. If you put it on uh, KMS wire afterward, I'll be able to okay. point out where the mistake was. So although uh, expectation of a discrete random variable is in general going to be a real number, it should be within the range of the sample space. So for a marginal expectation, it can't <laughs> be like negative or greater than 10 for one of the roles. And then uh, same thing with two rolls. <clears throat> it's got to be less than 10. So this, uh, this table here is what's called total, for the total number of pins you knock down on a frame of bowling. And we're going to use that a little bit more. OK. We can also do the same sort of thing to uh, define the expectation of a function of a discrete random variable. So let's say g of x is any function. And remember that a random variable is a function. So a function of a random variable is a random variable. Random variables have this viral-like property to them that any function of a random variable is a random variable. So g of x, you could say like y equals g of x or something like that. Uh, is a new random variable, and we want to know what its expectation is. What's the expectation of the function g of x? And that can be computed by summing over the entire sample space of x, uh, the g function evaluated at each little x, multiplied by the respective probability of x occurring. That summation over the entire sample space is the definition of the expectation of a function of x. So the expectation of g of x is g of x weighted by the probability of x summed over all the possibilities in the sample space for x. So that's the expectation of g of x. And in general, the expectation of g of x is not equal to g evaluated at the expectation of x. <clears throat> That is true if g is a linear function. But in general, g doesn't have to be a linear function, and in which case the expectation of g is not equal to g evaluated at mu, the expectation of x. <clears throat> That's in general true, and it's uh, especially true when g is a nonlinear function. So we already considered like a kind of a weird special case where g of x is equal to c times x. That's a linear function. And so it's true that the expectation of g of x is equal to the g function multiplied by the expectation of x. But that is not true in general. And that is not true for any nonlinear g function. Questions? With these things, with the expectations, you really just need to memorize this definition because it comes up so often that we're interested in an expectation or an estimate of the expectation. So if g of x is the particular function, x minus mu quantity squared, and we take the expectation of that g of x, <clears throat> that particular g function is so special that its expectation is known as the variance of x. <clears throat> uh, and it can be defined as the expectation of this function. It's again so special that it has its own Greek uh, symbol, sigma squared. <clears throat> um, and then, uh, do I have any chalk? Yep. So we want to show that the variance of x is equal to the expectation of the square minus the square of the expectation. And we're going to do that by expanding our function here. So that's a bracket. Okay. So that's equal to the expectation 
of. Uh, I'm gonna run out of space. So expectation of x squared minus expectation of uh, or plus negative two x mu plus expectation of mu squared. Everybody see that? OK. And then that is equal to this piece. OK. How can we simplify the expectation of negative 2x mu? All right, negative 2 is definitely a constant, so we can pull that out. But what else? Mu is also a constant. We're talking about the expectation of x. x is the random variable here. So, oh, I'm sorry. All right. So this is equal uh, to this plus negative 2 mu expectation of x plus this. All right? And so what's the expectation of x? All right? So we have this plus minus negative 2 mu squared plus, and then expectation of mu squared is mu squared. So that's 1 mu squared. So this is going to end up being, and now I've really run out of space, but hopefully you can see, <laughs> the expectation of the square of x minus the square of the expectation. So that is another thing that you ought to be, at least be able to follow when someone else does it based on you know, what we've already talked about, pulling out constants and then simplifying uh, things. So uh, expectation of x minus mu quantity squared, known as the variance, symbolized with little sigma squared. And we can conceptualize the variance as the expectation of the square minus the square of the expectation. Questions? OK. That is the variance of x. And it's obtained by taking the expectation of this particular g function, the square deviation of x from its mean, from its expectation, mu. OK. Uh, the square root of the variance is the standard deviation. So the variance is an expectation of a g function. The standard deviation is not. The standard deviation is a function of the variance, namely the square root of the variance, namely the positive square root of the variance. So a variance is an expectation of a g function. Standard deviation is not. But standard deviation is a more common uh, description for the spread of a random variable because the units of sigma are in the same units as x, whereas the variance is in units of x squared. So it's like, you know, people talk about income inequality or whatever. They talk about the standard deviation of income. They don't talk so much about the variance of income because that would be in squared dollars and like, Nobody has a squared dollar. Like it's hard to think about. Right. <coughs> um, thank you. But isn't sort of like arbitrary? Like it is the case that uh, variance is the expectation of g of x, but this only because we define uh, g of x as x minus mu squared. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's no g function for which the expectation is sigma. There is a g function for which the expectation is sigma squared, and then we can take the square root of that. But anyway, it just sigma cannot be written as the summation of something times probability. Another function that people talk about is the entropy, and that's defined by taking the expectation of the particular g function, negative log 
times the probability of x. We'll see as we come back to it. An important idea in Bayesian analysis for like selecting a distribution might be the one that has the most entropy. <clears throat> so we could calculate that in the case of bowling. Just take our function, negative log times the probability, or negative log of the probability, <clears throat> times the probability, sum it up over all of the possibilities, uh, and that number happens to be 2.36 guaranteed to be uh, non-negative in the case of a discrete random variable. We'll talk more about entropy uh, some other time. If somebody wants to steal his chair, go ahead, or her chair. Um, OK. So uh, next thing to consider is uh, decision theory. So uh, something that's very common way of thinking about things in economic and uh, finance and uh, things like that, is uh, organizations, individuals, should make decisions in the present that maximize expected utility in the future. And although there are some criticisms of this, it's hard to come up with a coherent um, rule for how people should behave that isn't you know, having something to do with expected uh, utility. So this is not a great description of how people actually behave, but is a normative statement as to how they should behave. And there's some you know, uh, properties that make this coherent. Uh, it's make decisions to maximize expected utility. And the way in which this ties to Bayesian analysis, one of the advantages of Bayesian analysis is the connection is very direct. To make a decision, you first have to enumerate D possible decisions that are under consideration. So for those of you who are in political science, this is certainly subject to agenda control uh, effects, but we're not going to worry about that right now. Next, um, someone making the decision needs to define a utility function, let's call it G, <coughs> that depends on the decision being considered but also cons uh, depends on some unknowns uh, that uh, you know, pertain to the future, or pertain to unknown parameters, anything that you don't know. Then step three, you want to update um, your probabilities, the conditional probability for all the things you don't know, given what you do know, namely data, using Bayes' rule, in order to get the conditional probabilities to come up with the expectation of utility under the different decisions that are under consideration. You evaluate, or you evaluate an estimate of the expectation of your utility function for each decision using the probabilities that you obtained in step three using from Bayes' rule. Uh, and then you choose the decision that, or you make the decision that has the highest value of expected utility over all the possibilities uh, in step four. So this seems like a very intuitive and useful procedure, or at least uh, in an abstract form. It's not often that you'll find someone who like strongly disagrees with this or says it's crazy or, or something like that. Uh, but certainly you have to ba use Bayes' rule in step three in order to get the conditional probabilities with which to form the expectation of you know the sum over you know whatever the the space is of uh, you know multiplied by the probabilities. So you have to use Bayes' rule. Also, whoever is deciding this is going to have to specify one what are the decisions under consideration, and two what is the utility function that is going to be used to rank the possible decisions. Now, in a business context. You can usually uh, assume that two is going to be the profit of the business. That is a pretty uh, simple assumption. One of the like main things in business school is how to ensure that executives are actually maximizing expected profit as opposed to the expected value of their stock options. Um, so to prevent you know insider trading and, and things like that. But you know in a business context, you can sort of always get people to at least say they agree, OK, the company should be maximizing expected profit. But you know, 
How do you take that expectation? You're going to need conditional probabilities. Where do you get those conditional probabilities? From Bayes' rule. How do we you know, go about doing that in practice? We use Stan. Uh, so there's a very tight connection between a fairly well accepted, at least in the abstract way, of making decisions when you don't know stuff uh, that connects with Bayes' rule and expectations using conditional probabilities. Um, you know, assuming you can specify what are under consideration. Now, this is in fairly sharp contrast with what it seems like businesses uh, actually do, which, you know, you can sort of, you know, characterize as, you know, whoever's making the decision, the boss or, you know, whatever, says to all these, like, data science or whatever teams this boss is managing, uh, you know, send me a one-page memo about your analysis of this decision that, you know, I have to make. And then the boss gets, like, all these one-page memos from all these different teams and then, you know, skims the one-page memos and then, you know, takes into consideration all the things that weren't considered in, like, the first paragraph of the one-page memos and then makes a decision and then goes play golf. But there's no, like, explicit connection between the data analysis and the decision. There's this gap here between I get these one-page memos and then I, like, gut feeling or whatever, make a decision, instead of this sort of explicit process that I'm outlining here, where the boss would say, okay, these are the decisions that we're thinking about making. The utility function is, you know, profit, and then asking the, the data analysis people to come up with those conditional expectations, and then, okay, we're going to go with what maximizes the conditional expectation of profit. Then there's like a really obvious connection between the data analysis that produces the conditional probabilities in three and how the decision gets made. Now, back in 2014, 2015, I uh, actually applied for, uh, to teach a class in the School of Professional Studies. They were starting a program in uh, applied analytics for people who'd already graduated from business school, were in the workforce, but wanted to come back and get another master's degree uh, to beef up their skills to sort of understand what all people like you and people from the Data Science uh, Institute that work in those companies uh, <coughs> were doing and saying and stuff with their data analysis. And they said to me, well, uh, you know, could you send us like a headshot to put on the website and write up a syllabus so we can, you know, put it and, you know, this was before they even started getting students. Uh, <coughs> and they were actually paying $6,000 per syllabus, but that's okay because it was coming from Columbia. Um, and so I wrote up this syllabus, you know, saying uh, kind of based on this idea of executive decision making, we wouldn't go into so much detail about how to do three, but talk about one, two, four, and five, assuming that, you know, someone who the boss is managing would be able to, to do the base rule thing to get them the conditional probabilities, but just saying like, this would be a good framework to teach managers about how to make decisions. And so they took that and they decided to fire me. Um, well, not so much fire as ghost. Um, they took me off the website and then wouldn't talk to me anymore. Um, so I don't know how you get ghosted by the university that you're still working at, but <laughs> anyway. They felt that was impractical, or someone felt that was impractical, that someone being a former executive of uh, Procter and Gamble, which I found <laughs> ironic, because Procter and Gamble was one of the first companies to start to use Stan, which was not something that the former executive of Procter and Gamble was aware of. <laughs> um, but anyway. It's out there. <laughs> Iterated expectations. Uh, so the expectation of a conditional expectation is a marginal expectation. So this is a little bit confusing. 
So if we have here on the inside uh, the expectation of y given that x is equal to some value little x, and we take that conditional expectation of y given little x, and then we take the expectation of that over the possible values of little x, what we get back in the end is the marginal expectation of y. And again, you can walk through this yourself. It's a little bit different, but the same sort of idea of you know, move things around, simplify it, take the summation. Uh, and what you find out at the end is the expectation over x of the conditional expectation of y given x is the marginal expectation of y. And so we can get at the marginal expectation of y maybe in multiple different ways depending on what is the easiest um, in a particular situation. And often uh, it's easiest to <coughs> take expectations over x of conditional expectations given x in order to get this marginal expectation of y. Um, so uh, we did it already with like the sum of two rows in bowling. But just to make it more explicit, if I have a function g that involves two random variables that are discrete, x and y, I can evaluate functions uh, or expectations of functions that involve two variables as long as I use the bivariate probability to weight with. So if g is the function uh, quantity x minus its expectation multiplied by quantity y minus its expectation, and x and y are discrete random variables. The covariance of x and y is defined as the expectation of that g function, the summation over the sample space of x, the summation over the sample space of y, the function that I want the expectation of, and I weight it with the joint probability that both x and y occur. That summation is the definition of the covariance between x and y. And it can be expressed as the expectation of the product minus the product of the expectations, if you go through the math. If I redefine my g function as the product between x minus mu divided by sigma, where sigma is the standard deviation of x, and then the same thing, y minus its expectation divided by the standard deviation of y, then the expectation of that g function is the definition of the correlation between x and y. <clears throat> Since sigma x and sigma y are constants, I can pull them out. And then we have summation summation here, which is the definition of covariance. And so we see that the covariance and the correlation are related. A uh, fairly universal symbol for correlation is the Greek letter rho. So rho is equal to the covariance between x and y divided by the standard deviation of x and divided by the standard deviation of y. Uh, since uh, the units of the standard deviation of x are in the units of x and the units of y are standard deviation of y, by dividing uh, by the units of x and y, we get rho, which is unit free. So the correlation between x and y is the same whether we use you know, feet or meters, whether we use dollars or euros, because uh, we cancel out the units. And consequently, a correlation is bound between <laughs> negative 1 and 1, while the covariance can be any real number. Uh, so the correlation is a more popular measure of linear dependence, because it does not depend on the units in which we express these random variables. But would the correlation be you know, very positive, very negative, close to 0, whatever, for two roles in the same frame of bowling? So if you exceed your marginal expectation on the first roll, there's fewer pins to knock down 
on the second roll. Therefore, you're going to tend to be lower than your marginal expectation on your second roll. So the signs of these two things tend to be different. The sign of a probability is always positive. So we have like positive times negative times positive. We're summing up a lot of things that tend to be uh, negative. And if we go through those calculations in R, you know, first calculating the covariance, then calculating the variance uh, margin on x1 and x2, divide the covariance by the square root of the variances, which is to say the product of the standard deviations. We get the correlation for two rolls in a same frame of bowling under our model, and it comes out to be negative 0.88. So a strong negative correlation between two rolls in the same frame of bowling. But uh, for the first roll of two different frames of bowling, the correlation would be zero if we assume that those two frames are independent. So correlation is a measure of linear dependence. If two random variables are independent, then their correlation is zero. However, the converse is not true. If you have two random variables, x and y, with zero correlation, that doesn't demean, that does not mean that they are independent because there could be some nonlinear form of dependence between x and y, which is not being measured by the correlation because the correlation is a measure of linear dependence only. So independence implies lack of correlation. Lack of correlation does not necessarily imply <coughs> independence. Questions? All right. Variance of a sum of two rolls in the same frame of bowling, running out of time a little bit. So you could calculate it just like this. Comes out to be 0.8. That just basically comes from the definition of a expectation of a particular uh, g function. So if we take total minus the expectation uh, for what happens in both roles, square that, weight it by the joint probabilities, sum up over all 66 possibilities, we get 0.8. But the variance of the sum of two roles in the same frame of bowling can also be written, and you should maybe be able to show this, uh, as the sum of the marginal variances, variance of x1 plus the variance of x2, plus twice the covariance between x1 and x2. In this case, the covariance, like the correlation, is negative. Multiply it by 2, add, and we get exactly the same number. So whereas the expectation of a sum is equal to the sum of the expectations, irrespective of whether the two variables, or however many variables you're considering, are independent or not, the variance of a sum is not simply equal to the sum of the variances. It's equal to the sum of the variances plus twice the covariance. And so if the covariance is 0, then it simplifies. But in general, the uh, variance of a sum is not equal to the sum of the variances. So that's another thing that you, know, you might be able to show with uh, using the property that the variance is equal to the expectation of the square minus the square of the expectation and expanding all that out. OK, final thing for today. Um, if we're, anytime we're talking about sampling without replacement, which is essentially what bowling is, like you knock down some pins on the first roll of your frame of bowling, and then they stay down for the, the second, uh, as opposed to you know, if you were to put all the pins right immediately back up. Um, but in general, a good uh, probability function for sampling without replacement is known as the hypergeometric distribution. And its uh, function that defines it uh, depends on uh, m, n, and k. So we have some random variable x that's the number of uh, successes you get when you draw from some finite set. So if m is the number of good elements in the set being drawn from, n is the number of bad elements in the set being drawn from, k 
is the number of times that you draw, <coughs> and x is the random variable for the number of successes that you draw, uh, then it can be written as this, which involves a product of the choose function. So the choose function is written like this. It's like a fraction without the bar. Uh, it is defined as a factorial divided by b factorial divided by a minus b factorial. And that's defined to be 0 if a is less than b. Anyway, you put all that together, and you get a function that tells you the probability of getting x good draws <coughs> if there are m uh, good values in the set, n bad values in the set, and you draw k times. So, and that function, uh, it's implemented in R, but let's just think uh, conceptually, how can we use this to get the probability of being dealt uh, 21 if you're playing blackjack, which is to say being dealt an ace and either a 10, a jack, a queen, or a king. The ace is worth 11, and all of the others are worth uh, 10. So what's the probability of being dealt an ace and one of the cards that's worth 10 to give you a 21 and a blackjack? So we could use the hypergeometric, but actually in this case, it simplifies to something maybe a little bit easier. Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, you're on the right track, not exactly. So it's not 52 choose four. There's four aces out of 52. So the probability of being dealt an ace first is 4 50 seconds, or 1 13th. OK, so let's say I have an ace. Then what do I need to do? Then out of 51 cards left, mm -hmm. you need to get one of 12. 16. Ten. So 10, jack, queen, king, all worth. Oh, 16. Right. So times 16 divided by 51 because there's 51 cards left in a single deck. That works out to be a special case of the hypergeometric where k is equal to 1. So k, if you're just drawing once, it's, or in this case, like once for the 10 and then once for the ace, um, it's a little bit simpler. Uh, but this formula works if you're drawing multiple times. So, uh, you know, probability of this and Either the ace could come first or the ace could come second, so there's two ways of doing it, comes out to 0.48. So you have a little bit less than a 5% chance to get a dealt a blackjack. <clears throat> Last thing for today, what is the probability if you're playing blackjack, you get dealt two values or two cards that have the same value, in which case you get the option to split them and play them as two different hands against the dealer. How would we compute the probability of being dealt two cards that have the same value? So that would give me, if I multiplied that by 450 seconds, the probability of getting a particular pair, like a pair of eights. What, how would we use this to get the probability of getting any pair? But that was a start. Um, just multiply by 13. Almost, but we have to remember that Jack and queen are different, but they have the same value. So in most places in America, if you get dealt a jack and a queen, 
you can split even though it's a terrible idea. Um, so we, that would work for ace two, three, four up to nine. And then what do we do for all the things that are valued 10? It, they all count for 10. Okay. Um, so that's, uh, that's, that's 16 part? Uh-huh. 16 out of uh, 36? No. Where did you get the 36 from? Took away the one, and then that was the three. Uh, uh, yeah, that's their point. Yeah. Anybody help him? So let's review. How do we get the probability of a pair of aces, twos, threes, fours, five, six, seven, eights, or nines? Right, so that would give us like the probability of getting two nines. And the probability of getting two eights is the same as that. The probability of getting two sevens is the same as that. So we could just calculate the probability of getting a particular pair multiplied by 9, and that would give us the probability of any pair between ace, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Yep. And then we need to add on one piece for the probability of getting two cards that are both valued at 10, which is to say 10s, jacks, queens, or kings. So, yes. Uh, will that be part of it? So we could use the hybrid geometric uh, function. So 9 times the probability of getting a pair of ace 2 up through 9. And then uh, uh, plus, because we're adding here, we have basically or the probability of getting two cards that are valued as 10. And so for that, we would do d hyper x equal 2, because we want two successes. Uh, there's 16... Uh, cards that are valued as 10 in a single deck. Uh, there would be 36, which is the number of not 10s in the deck. That's where you got the 36 from. <coughs> and we're going to draw k equal to twice to get to. So the probability of all that added together, 0 0.131. Probability of getting two cards dealt having the same value. So this is another function that is uh, very applicable in the somewhat rare but nevertheless uh, you know, enough to worry about situations in which you're doing sampling without replacement. But other than that, it's just completely random. All right? That's all for today. Uh, pick it up on Thursday. Read the syllabus. Catch up if you just joined the class recently and you're behind. Like I said at the beginning, maybe not all of you heard, uh, I've moved as many people as I can off the wait list. If I, you haven't heard from me, that means you're still on the wait list, and you can only get in if somebody else drops. But in, if past experience is uh, any prelude, there'll be some of that, so you still have a good chance to get into class. All right? I'll post it on Thursday.